For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. Now, we don't know who wrote the book of Hebrews. Doesn't matter or else God would have told us. But, book of Hebrews, chapter number 1, goes through and talks about the message that had been delivered. Well, what was that? It was the message that Christ came to preach and teach, called the gospel. And then, it's the same message that he left with his disciples and his followers after, that they should go and tell the world. But in chapter number 1, keep in mind the book of Hebrews was written to the Hebrews, but the Hebrews believed the law, they believed the prophets, they believed the Old Testament. And chapter number 1 of the book of Hebrews says, hey, if we believe you know, Moses, we believe all the prophets, if we believe the law. If we believe those things which, because in the Old Testament, every now and then, an angel would appear with a message to a prophet or a man of God. He says, if God dispensed angels from heavens to be ministers and messengers, and we believe and revere those words, he says, how much more should we believe and fear, revere the words of his only begotten son? He says, if at sundry times he came and he talked to us through, he preached to Balaam through a donkey, right? Not too long before this, he preached to Peter through a rooster. Right? They did, that, God's not limited in what he can use. So he says, why are you putting emphasis on things that were delivered through Abraham or through Moses or through any of the prophets? He says, God's very son walked on earth, yet you want to discredit what he said and the things that he did. Then in chapter number 2, he goes on how we ought to give. That's why in chapter 2, verse 1, therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard. Why? Because they weren't delivered by angels. They weren't delivered by prophets. They weren't delivered by ministers. They were delivered by God the Son. Then, by the time we get down to verse number 14, it's talking about why Christ did things the way that he did them in his earthly ministry. He wrote the book of Hebrews, God the Father through the Holy Ghost, pulled back a curtain and showed them a little bit of insight on what happened way back in the yonder, the Alpha of time. Because the Bible says that Jesus was the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world. Meaning the plan was in place long before it ever came and put on a robe of flesh. So, a little bit of insight into why things happened the way that they did. Verse number 14 says, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood. Who's that? Us. He's talking about the children after the world. Okay, the children of Abraham in this case. Right? But descendants. They say, We are partakers of flesh and blood. We was born in it. We live in it. No other way for us to go about it. Right? You can't just... Uh, we, it'd, be, it'd make being spiritual a whole lot easier if you could just wake up and say, all right, flesh, you stay here today. I'm going to work. Right? But we can't do that. We are bound to it. We were born into it. We are partakers. Okay, that means that we each have an equal portion. When you become a partaker with Christ, the idea is that you equally become yoked together with him. A partaker is one that says, I want just as much as everybody else. I don't want less. I don't want more. We're all equal in this thing. So when it says, the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he's talking about of death and the curse of sin. We each got the same help in a sin when we was born. We each were partakers with death. Nobody dies less than anybody else. Death is death. But death is no respecter of persons, just like God is no respecter of persons. God meets unto every man an equal measure of faith. Why? So that they can become partakers of Christ. But in the same, we all were cursed with the same level of sin and death. Because just a little bit of sin brings death. Doesn't matter how much sin you may commit, you've got the same portion that everybody else does. 
Your soul takes up just as much room in hell as anybody else's would. We're all equal partakers of flesh and blood. It says for, for as much, meaning because we all had the same measure of curse, talking about Christ, it says he also himself likewise took part of the same. Meaning, in order for me to take their portion, I've got to be made in like manner. There's the, I wish we had time, but if you go to the book of Ruth, if you go to the Old Testament law, you're going to find out about the law of the kinsman redeemer. And that means that somebody who wasn't an Israelite could be redeemed or bought. Essentially, you're paying their portion, and then as a result, you bring them into the family. You have to become a partaker of them. Meaning it doesn't matter if they've got debt, if they've got land, if they've got outstanding business from whatever happened before, you can redeem it. But you've got to become a part of it. They've got to become a part of you. Okay, well, in Ruth's case, we know that Boaz, right, he, I don't have time to go through the whole thing, but Ruth was married to an Israelite man. She wasn't an Israelite woman. She was a Moabitess. Okay, but when her husband, who was a Hebrew, died, when her father-in-law, who was a Hebrew, died, when her brother-in-law, who also was a Hebrew, died, there was nobody, according to the law, that should have been there to take care of Ruth if anything were to happen to her husband. So Naomi, who later calls herself Mara, says, we're going back home. And looks at her two daughter-in-laws and says, y'all can come or y'all can stay, but do what you want to do. Ruth says, your God, my God, your people, my people. Right? When I join the family, I was in, so I'm in. But then, long story short, she gets back, she finds favor in the eyes of a man named Boaz, who wasn't the closest family member. You have somebody in the bloodline that wanted to redeem you. He said, there's one that's nearer than me. So he went down to the gate and had a business meeting and left a shoe with the guy as a promise. But in that business meeting, he says, I will redeem the property of both Ruth and all that was attached to her name but then also by proxy he tags everything that Naomi had as well he buys the land that used to belong to her husband and gives it to her that she might live off of it Okay, but he redeemed the land, he redeemed Ruth and Naomi to where they were no longer outcasts, they had no male factor to take care of, now they're part of the tribe again, they're part of the family well in order to do that Boaz had to say their problems are now my problems. Don't go talk to them about their problems anymore. Come talk to me about their problems. Because their problems are my problems. Any debts that they had before, now they're my debts. Right? The land that was grown, if anybody's been farming that land, because there was a rule that if it was unused lands, you could glean from it if you needed to. Right? So long as you gave recompense to one that owned it. But he's saying, if anybody's been doing business on that land, don't go talk to them. Come talk to me. They're a part of my household. And as the head of the household, their business is my business. If you want to go talk to them, you got to come through me. Right? The olden days. If you've got business, who do you go to? You go talk to the father. You don't talk to the boy or the nephew or somebody else. No, you go talk to who's in charge. If he tells you to go talk to somebody else, then you go talk to that person. But you always start with the one that's the head of the household. The one that has the closest relationship to the patriarch. Okay, we'll get to that here in a second. But it says in verse number 14 that he also himself likewise took part of the same. Of what? Flesh and blood. Flesh, he was robed in flesh. He was fashioned like a man. Why? So that he could become a partaker of our fleshly nature. See, Adam and Eve were robed in flesh. 
and before they sinned, it was a perfect flesh, sinless flesh, made in the very image of God, the Bible tells us. There wasn't anything wrong with flesh until man decided to sin. So Christ was robed in flesh, but his flesh wasn't like our flesh. His flesh may have sweat. In fact, we know that in the Garden of Gethsemane, he sweat as if it were great drops of blood. His flesh worked like our flesh, but it wasn't the same. Because his flesh wasn't tainted by sin. Under the law, that lamb had to be spotless, without blemish. His flesh wasn't like yours and mine. The Bible says that he made himself with no reputation. That he was not comely to look upon. You wouldn't think that he's anything special by looking at him. Just like you wouldn't know that a sheep out in the middle of the field is spotless or whether it's got a whole bunch of blemishes until what? Until you start inspecting it. You got to take it aside and put it away from everything else and do what? Watch it. Everybody that's ever paid attention to what Christ did, they start inspecting the deeds that he did and the accounts of all that happened, how it was preserved. You're le Somebody said if you took one silver dollar and you were to cover the state of Texas with one, just start with one silver dollar for every miracle or every promise or every piece of the Old Testament law that Jesus fulfilled while he was here in 30, 30 and a half years. Not only would it cover the entire state of Texas, it came up to three feet high. Silver coins stacked. That's more than, well, I, th I think I believe it more than I don't believe it. God gave you every reason to be without excuse to believe it. But unless you take a closer look at the lamb, you're not going to find anything special to look at. Why? Because his flesh looked like our flesh. He was robed in like manner, made himself of no reputation. But if you took a closer look, you come to find out that's not just any ordinary lamb. That's the lamb, capital L. Amen. That's the one that one day is going to be Lord of Lords and King of Kings. He already is now, but one day he'll be crowned Lord of Lords and King of Kings. What are you saying, Brother Jordan? He took on flesh so that you could identify with him you can't identify with God you can't identify with the thrice holy all powerful no one is his equal has thrown in the sides of the north he said let there and then everything that we know that exists was created Amen. you can't identify with that you have no connection to God sin broke that you had to have somebody come down to where you were. Just like Boaz had to come down to where Ruth was in order to redeem her. You find that one night she sleeps at his feet while they're out there at the threshing floor and he covers her with his, or with his skirt, it says, with his blanket. What's he saying? He's saying, I'm coming to you. You're no better than me. I'm no better than you. I'm coming down to your level to let you know that I care about you where you're at. You don't have to become something else in order to get warmth down here at my house. You don't have to change who you are to find favor with me. I came to where you were because you couldn't come to where I was. He became a partaker of flesh and blood, not because it gained him anything, but for your sake. Because when he wanted to redeem you, he had to take on everything that you were. He took everything that you were and said, that's mine now. Don't go talk to them about their problems. Come talk to me about their problems. They've been redeemed. Means it's as if it never happened on their account. I took all that used to be theirs, now it's mine. It's not theirs anymore. They're free to do as I command them to do. Those responsibilities have been taken away from them, now they're my responsibilities. All that they're responsible to do is what the master asked them to do. I'll take care of the burdens and the weight and everything else. Where are you going with this, Brother Jordan? Oh, look, verse number 14. He also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. 
There's only one thing that God had never done since the alpha of time, and that's die. Right? He knows all things. He's everywhere at once. He's done, but it's impossible for God, as a whole, you know, thrice holy being, to die. He's eternal. That he is from old to everlasting, the Bible tells us. You can't wrap your mind around God. God can't die unless God chose to lay down his life. Well, God can't die spiritually in heaven. His spirit is eternal. He can't die spiritually, so what do you have to do? He had to become like us. Y'all ever realize that there's never been an angel that died? Why do you think hell was created? It was an eternal place to inflict punishment upon eternal beings. The devil and his angels. There's never been an angel that's died. The first thing that ever died was man. But actually, if we go back, it was those animals that God slaughtered in order to make those garments for Adam and Eve. But when it comes to flesh, things that were created by God for his honor and for his glory, the first thing that ever died was man. What he's saying, Brother Jordan, God had to come down and show that he was stronger than death. Why did death come about? Because a serpent beguiled a woman in a garden. The disobedience of Lucifer was passed on and adopted by man. And that disobedience brought death and destruction ever since. We know that the Bible says that the devil's the father of all lies, but he's also the father of all death. The angel had never been cast out of heaven until one day he tried to usurp the throne of God, the book of Isaiah tells us. What happened? Him and a third of the angels in heaven got cast out, but they didn't die. Then he looks around and he sees that there was one that found favor in God's eyes. His name was Adam. So he's going to do everything he could to destroy Adam. So he introduced Adam and Eve to this thing called doubt and disobedience. As a result, death came. He was the father of death. In his mind, he knew what would happen if Adam and Eve sinned and disobeyed God. And he willfully did it anyway. So when the Bible says that Jesus rose victorious and had the keys to death and hell, that he got up out of the grave, the devil forged his own key of death, but he didn't own it. He just thought he invented it. Well, long before he ever brought sin into the world, before man ever died, before he was ever cast out of glory, God already knew that death was coming. And he allowed it to take place. The devil didn't have any control over death. God just let him have a key for a while. But by coming and putting on flesh like us, he became a partaker of death. He said, I'm taking death and I'm making it a part of me in the flesh. Y'all ever stop to think, knowing that sin is the thing that causes us to die? If Jesus wasn't crucified... If it was God's will for him to stay robed in the flesh, if he's sinless, Brother Ron, he'd live for forever in the flesh. The only reason he put on flesh, knowing that in and of if everything in a vacuum, he'd have never died in the body. But he put on flesh for one purpose to die. For what purpose? So that he could say, I, being robed in flesh like them, now are their kinsmen. You know the closest claim that the devil has to ownership over man's soul? Is that they were disobedient like he was. He's got no connection to them. He's got no way that he could say, we come from the same place. He was an angel. And charge all the music and glory before he was cast out. They were made in the image of God. Man has no idea what it is to be an angel. No idea 
what it is to be a minister for one of God's purposes and glory. The devil has no identification of man. It's just that he claims they should be destroyed like I was destroyed. So when Christ came and he became a partaker of death, first he was roped in flesh to say, I'm a partaker of their nature. Flesh and blood, I'm now a partaker of that. But then, not just their nature, he says, I'm going to be a partaker of their destiny. Man was born to die once sin entered into this world. No getting around it. And to die without God is to spend all of eternity in hell. So what did Jesus do? He said, not only am I going to be a partaker of their nature, I'm going to be a partaker of their destiny. I'll take their death spiritually so that they don't have to die spiritually. This flesh is still going to have to go back to the ground. You've still got to bear your own burdens. And so fulfill the law of Christ, the Bible says. But Christ said, take my yoke upon you for it's easy and my burden is light. He took your spiritual death and now all you've got to deal with is the fleshly death. Well, to be absent with the body is to be present with the Lord. That's a liberating thing now. It's not a damning thing anymore. Look with me in verse number 15. Deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Does not the Bible say that death is the king of terrors? Those that don't know Christ, the greatest fear in their life, whether they'll admit it or not, is the fear of death. It's why people take all them goofy pills that they see commercials for on the television because it's supposed to make you better or it's supposed to make you healthier. Or it's supposed to fix this problem in your life. And it's supposed to stave off this potential problem that could be or couldn't be an issue that you have to deal with. It just depends. That's why some people get up and go to the gym at you know 3.30 in the morning and work out for so many hours. Right? Lord help them. That ain't me. But it's why people will drink seaweed smoothies and all these other things. Oh, it's got plenty of antioxidants and healthy stuff in it. You can have it. I read that regardless of what you eat, as long as you give thanks to God for it, that God bless it. But I also find that the Bible says that you're not supposed to be a glutton. Guilty. I'm not talking about you, talking about me. Thank God gave you a pretty good diet plan. What is it? Eat what you're supposed to. Not more than you're supposed to, not less than you're supposed to. Eat what God gives you to eat. Give God the glory for having it, and God's going to bless it. You believe that, Brother Jordan? I believe it so much that I just double down and say, well, unless I got, in case I got it wrong the last time, we're going to do it again just to make sure I got it right this time. But here in verse number 15, the fear of death is what drives people to eat all those so-called healthy things. But study your Bible. Guess what Jesus ate a lot of? Fish and bread. Wherever we find a document. It says that there's great feasts that he went to. Well, you can't have a feast with only bread and fish. What's that mean? It means that there's probably a spread there that day. We know that he didn't defy the Old Testament laws, so we know certain things that he didn't eat. But we don't know what the Lord ate. You know what he ate? What God put in front of him to eat. There's sometimes they needed food to eat. And he said, hey, cast the net on the other side. We've been fishing all night, Lord. Just do it, Peter. All right. At thy word, I'll let it down again. What happens? It's such a draft of fish that it's trying to sink the boat that they're trying to pull them into. They got to call all their buddies back from the shore to come out and help them drag all the fish in. He's saying, God knew exactly what they needed it when they needed it. But I'll show you every time that they sat down, what they do? They gave thanks for it. They blessed the Lord for putting them at the table. It may not have even been their table. But they blessed the Lord for making a seat for them at that table and giving provision to that person. We know that Lazarus, Mary and Martha, I think it'd be safe to say that they frequented there 
Why? Because they were well acquainted with the Lord. Even after they raised Lazarus, where do you find them? Sitting down eating at the table with the Lord. Many came to see and bear witness to it. There are many things that it doesn't matter what you're a partaker of, but there's some people that are so afraid of what's unknown, what's at death. They don't know what's coming beyond the grave. That shapes every decision that they make in their life. Terrified of it. Really, that's the base of most fears in people's lives, is death. People are afraid of swimming. Why? Because they're afraid of drowning. People are afraid of heights. Why? Because they're afraid of falling. People are afraid of the dark. Why? Because they think there's something out there that can hurt them. It's not only the king of terrors, it's also a chain. That fear binds people. It gets a little energizer bunny going inside of their head and they think they've got to work because the day is short. The time of the season is short. They know they're not going to live for forever. So they're going to try and kill themselves in the first 60, 70 years of their life to enjoy the last 10 in retirement. That doesn't sound like a good plan to me, Brother Ron. Math don't add up there. But there are people that go out and they labor to give all earthly pleasures to those that they care about. Why? Because they know that they're not going to live forever and they want to see them around them happy. They want to enjoy it and they want to have things that other people don't. Why? So that they're going to live a better life here than somebody else. They think this is the only one we get. Might as well make it fun. What's all that motivated by? They're running out of time. You can trace everything that man in his carnal nature does to one thing. He knows that he's going to die. But according to verse number 15, Christ, when he came and became a partaker of your nature and then chose to die the death that he did so that he could take your death, says, deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. It's real easy to control somebody if they're already binding themselves due to fear of death you know how the devil got Eve first he got her to doubt the word of God but then second he said you shall not surely die called God a liar and then said ye shall become as lower case g gods knowing the difference between good and evil he said you're going to be like God knowing the difference between good and evil God doesn't know what evil is. God just knows what good is and anything that isn't good, he knows is evil. God isn't a partaker of evil. He's holy. But when Adam and Eve sinned, they learned what holiness, which is what they were, and righteousness, and being what God expected them to be, and then they also knew what sin was. And once they knew what sin was, they knew what evil was, and they were able to discern between good and evil. The devil didn't lie to them. He did. But when he said that they know the difference between good and evil, that was true. But it didn't make them a god. All that it made them was damned for all of eternity. And ever since that day, if somebody knows that they're headed to death, well, if you do this, it may make you live two years longer. Well, of course somebody's going to try it. Well, if you could do this, you could travel across the country in only a few days instead of months, building the Transcontinental Railroad. So then you can live in New York and have family in California, and it's not going to take you 19 years to get out there and see them again. And since you don't have that much time, you might as well see them as often as you can. It's just more convenient. Oh, we want to go to Mars. Why? Because they think this world's destined to global warming and who knows what else. Well, it's going to get real hot one day, but it ain't going to be global warming. It's going to be the wrath of God poured out. But everything they do, fear of death. Got to get rid of your, your gasoline cars, man. To make the air dangerous to breathe, man. Yeah, and what do you think happens to all them car batteries when they stop charging? Think that's healthy for the world? Oh, just check it out there in the ocean. Let's see what happens. 
but they don't. They're always putting a spin on something to make it seem like it's better for you. And you buy it because that fleshly part of you knows that it's going to die. It's a chain. It's bondage. You are bound to death, but it also bound you to fear. Then verse number 16, For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. He didn't come to redeem the devil and his kind. He took on the nature of man to redeem you. The seed of Abraham. Now remember we was talking about that kinsman redeemer, talking about the one that was closest in the family line, had the first chance or the opportunity to redeem. They had to pass it up in order for somebody further down the family tree to redeem them. Well, if you go back and you study, you've got Rahab and Ruth both in the family tree of God. Right? Rahab, Boaz's mom. And Boaz marries Ruth. Well, if you go study, Rahab came from Jericho. Ruth came from Moab. And if you study that out, based off of you know what God, what Moses wrote in the first five books of the Bible about what happened to the descendants of Noah, you know who that includes? Everybody. It's all of them. Every group that you could imagine, Jesus has a blood claim, relative-wise, to find the way back to you. You say, that true, Brother Jordan? Yeah, otherwise he couldn't be your kinsman redeemer. Amen. When it says that he grafted in a branch to the vine, that branch was called Gentiles. And when he grafted it in, that means that it was made a part of the other vine. Meaning you can't tell the two apart anymore. So when he came and became a partaker of death, he said, I've paid the price already. Boaz had to buy the land that Ruth had to claim to because he can't just take something that don't belong to him. He says, I want Ruth, but in order to do that, I'm going to have to buy her husband's property her brother-in-law's property and her father-in-law her, yeah her father-in-law's property and technically the one that owned it all was Naomi so he's got to buy it and give her the price for it but then he's also taking both of them into her home or into his home in other words you don't get to just claim something you got to pay for it well, verse number 17, Wherefore in all things it behooved him to make, be made like unto his brethren, talking about man, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. you got to buy it. But then, you've got to build on it. You've got to put a stake down. You've got to lay a claim to what you've purchased. But he's saying, Brother Jordan, well, verse number 17, it behooved him. In other words, it was convenient for God. It was the best way to do it. Behooved him to be made like unto his brethren. Again, he was robed like us. He became a partaker of flesh and a partaker of blood, but his blood wasn't like our blood. His blood came from the heavenly father. Ours come from sinful fathers. He became a partaker, meaning I'm attaching their wagon to my horse. He didn't want what we had. He came to take what we had and attach it to him. Then, it says that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest. Go and study it out. He was touched with all the feeling of the infirmities that we have. Yet was he without sin. Tempted in all, all, part, all parts as we are. Didn't sin. Experienced everything in the flesh that you and I will ever encounter and yet he was still perfect. And he became a partaker so that he could become relatable. 
You realize that before Jesus was robed in flesh, God, the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, had never been tempted to sin before? Because you can't tempt the one that is altogether holy. But yet the devil tempted Christ in the flesh. Was it to prove that Christ couldn't be tempted? No, he'd never been tempted all throughout time. It was to prove to you that he overcame all the temptations that you went through. He was being merciful unto you. That's why he endured all that he endured. So that he could prove to you that he was that he can be faithful to overcome all of your problems because he's already conquered them. Through his mercy, he embraced everything that was a part of your daily life in order to give you the life that he desired you to have. He said, I've already overcome, I've paid that price. You may not have enough to pay that price, I've already paid it. I threw that onto my load. What you got in return was, I just ask you to be faithful. Like I'm faithful to you. He did it through mercy. Did it so that he could prove to you that he would be faithful. Then it says to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. He paid the price, but he had to put it into practice. He had to build on it. He didn't just shed the blood. He's been applying it to people's lives ever since. The blood would have been no good if it just sat on the mercy seat of God and nobody ever asked for it. It says to make reconciliation. He doesn't offer reconciliation. He makes it. That means that he takes that blood and he removes what separated you and God. Then he takes all of you that he just bought with that blood and he attaches you to him. Reconciliation means to bring two things that were apart together. How much closer can you get to God than when he said that we are the tabernacle of the Holy Ghost, he lives in us, that we are in Christ, meaning that we live because we're in him. We're attached at both hips to him. No place you can go in space, time, distance, you could go to an alternate reality if you wanted to. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Amen. Well, he attached you to him. As it said, we're engraved in the palms of his hands. He has an everlasting testament that he bought and paid for your sin. That he made you a part of him. Why did he do that? To reconcile you. Because God couldn't come in His holiness to where you were because our God is a consuming fire. Anything that's not holy and gets too close to God, it gets consumed and burned up. So what did He do? He put on a veil of flesh so that you could understand that God came down here. You couldn't see Him as He was. He just let a little bit of any vision of what he was on the Mount of Transfiguration shine through and Peter's ready to start building temples right there on the spot but he's saying you really think that man could handle it if Jesus showed up in all his glory no I know what's going to happen when that happens when the sky gets rolled back and his face is shown in the sky men are going to run to the mountains and hills and pray to be killed so they don't have to look him in the face in all of his glory that wouldn't work for you. So what did he do? He put on a veil. Something to keep you from seeing his true nature, but yet in that partaking robe of flesh, what did he do? He came down so that you could understand him in the way that you needed to. You can't wrap your head around God, but you can wrap your head around a Savior. You can't wrap your head around eternal atonement and the process that had to go into paying for your sin, but you can understand an Old Testament picture of a lamb being slain to push back the sins of a nation for a year. And then you can understand when he comes and he says that he was the lamb of God. So John the Baptist said, Behold the lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world. Why? Because John 
looked past the veil and he saw who he really was. John didn't even need to see him. He was still in his mama's belly when he heard Jesus was coming. He did a front flip or a somersault or something down in there. Because he knew that he is the Lord. It was the forerunner. Make straight, make ready the way of the Lord. Why? Because he's coming. He's not coming to roll in rain. He's coming to forgive. That's what that baptism was a picture of. Before him, he was nasty and dirty. But if he was buried with him and risen again in new life, old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. Why do you think Jesus said through the song, taste and see that the Lord is good? Through the Psalms. Because on the outside, it may look like a regular apple. It may look like just another grape. Why? Because he had that veil on. But he came and he did all those things so that he could reconcile you to where he was. He doesn't want you robed in flesh. He wants you to have a body like his and one day you're going to get it. He doesn't want you to be tempted and to be overcome by temptation, to give in to temptation. So why do you think that he was tempted like we were? Verse number 18. That he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. You can't help somebody unless you've already overcome what they're struggling with. So what did he do? He made himself like you to overcome everything that you'll ever face so that he could be your help and he could be your friend that sticketh closer than a brother. And more than that, he took all of the wrong in your life and he made it a part of his life so that he could give you all the good of being a child of God. What are you saying, Brother Jordan? Oh, what a Savior. Oh, how he loves you and me. But it says to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. You know what that means? It means everybody. Not just some. For the people. Not the person. Not the household. Not the nation. All the people. Reconciliation is as if there was never a divide in the first place. We're used to scars. We're used to things leaving a mark. If it had ever dawned on you that in the eyes of God there's never been a time that you weren't His child. Because when He reconciled you, there's no more Grand Canyon between you and God. There's no more lying in the dirt where there used to be a canyon, but He's pushed them back together. No, it's as if it had always been connected. Reconciled I mean, in God's mind, after the blood of Christ has been applied to your life, there's always been a place for you in heaven. It's been built from old to everlasting. Because in his mind, once reconciliation has happened, there's never been a time that you weren't a part of his family. Because that time in, when you weren't saved, the time when you were at enmity with God, that doesn't exist anymore because it's been reconciled. It's been forgiven. It's been erased. The Bible says my sins are gone. Well, all the memory of you being a sinner is also gone in God's mind. And from God's point of view, He looks back and He just sees your name in the book and He knows that His Son is everlasting. So He knows any that came to Him by His Son are also everlasting. So in his eyes, when you get to glory, you're going to have the same perspective as God. That you've, How do you think that your conversation's already recorded there? Because he's had it recorded from everlasting. I know that's going to blow some of y'all. How do you think that there's a place reserved for you at the table? Because it's always been there with your name on it. You say, is that predestination, Brother Jordan? No, I'm just saying that God's got providential knowledge. He knew. Because in order for the blood to be applied, that means that all that time, God just forgot about it. It's gone. It's reconciled. There's no even reminder that there was once a divide. All there is is you, as God knows that you will be for all of eternity. 
He doesn't care about this because you know what this is? This is still part of that divide. Well, I'm robed in flesh. That's why I'm robed in His righteousness right now. God's already forgot about this. He's on to something bigger and better. We're just waiting to meet up with it. Because in his mind, there's never a time that I was robed in this, that I had to deal with this. Why? Because he became a partaker of what we were so that I can be like him forevermore. Did you know that you could receive a daily devotion every morning in your inbox? Head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on Daily Devotions to sign up today. And as always, thanks for listening.